now you're starting to see reports um and one of them you mentioned earlier but you know we've got one to two year supply and you know from a major bank now saying this is what we have above ground Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics as we continue our coverage on what is nice after a bear market over the past couple of years. We have a continuing gold and silver rally that not only has the price of both metals rallied, but really as it's gone along, we've, we've seen some things that I think there's some consensus in the gold and silver community that haven't quite seen anything like this. I mean, maybe 2011 was had some similarities at points, but just seeing the gold price in particular continue to power through uh, 350 bucks in less than two months, and now seeing silver finally moving into action. So certainly some nice times and things to be happy and positive about. And fortunately to join join me today and talk about them. Steve Cope of Silver Viper, who I know is feeling good and positive about the uh, metals prices. Obviously, we do this every month, and people have seen our calls from last year when we were looking for the reasons for optimism, and fortunately, some of them manifesting. So, Steve, it's great to have you on in here this week uh, at at a time where things are going well. And how's everything going with you today? It's it's long overdue, Chris, and it, yeah, it definitely feels like we get a little bit of vindication looking at what's happening in the market and seeing things finally start to turn and, and make a, some sort of semblance of, of sense, you know, of why silver and gold are moving up. And, and honestly, moving up at times, you know, with, with some of the traditional data coming out over the last, you know, couple of weeks that traditionally would have knocked it down, you know, as using, you know, as a tool to prevent it from running. And while you might see a momentary dip in a day based on it, you know, just seeing that momentum and it turn and then still push up on days that you had, you know, jobs numbers or different things that like I said would have traditionally knocked it down. And so it's, you're just kind of seeing, it feels like there's a bit of an end coming to all the things that were holding it back and maybe, you know, they're running out of ammo to hold us down. Yes, it certainly does. And I'm going to pull up a chart here so we can take a look. We do have some interesting bank reports that have come out in the past couple of days that we'll dig into. One of them mentioning perhaps the next silver squeeze, talking about a lot of the things that you and I have been discussing for a while, Steve. But first, just any general thoughts. Here we have the silver chart. We're recording Monday afternoon. We have a price of 27.82. Here we were back in mid-February on the 12th, close to $22. So $6 move in silver, uh, $350 move in gold. There it was back on the 12th, right around the $2,000 mark, now up at 23.46. Any thoughts in general on what may be driving this or any other observations you've had before we dig into a few other questions? Yeah, I mean, going back that far, I mean, again, I think it the main driver in all of this is the expectation that we're going to be coming to rate cuts here. I mean, I've still held pretty steadfast going back. You go, go back through a lot of our videos that June would be the time for that. Whether it's June or it gets pushed off one, I mean, we've generally accepted that there's going to be two, three, maybe more if we get lucky here, rate cuts this year. Um, that, you know, especially in an election year, it doesn't, there should be a lot of pressure from the Democrats to try and somehow make this economically look better for, for their people, which doesn't seem to be happening. But again, you know, they want to show and rate cuts will help on that front. I, I think that's the main driver and why a lot of those daily, you know, jobs numbers and everything else when they come out are, aren't just aren't affecting it because it's been held down for so long. People can see now you know, an avenue where, you know, you're going to start freeing up capital as, as rates come down. Um, I, that, that's what's driving it. You know, there's other things, you know, we get into that are extra and why I think this run is going to be a lot different than the past two cycles where silver hit $50 and that's, you know, the industrial demand side and, and a lot of the reports that are coming out on that, which I think are, in the long term going to drive this to whatever new record high is i mean you can see people predicting in the thousands you know 300 200 
rather you know 50 as the last high i you know the industrial demand and how important that is to the price of silver this time above and beyond the monetary side which is still very important and why it's moving up probably more directly right now and so i'm really excited about where we're going to go from here you know let's see where silver is the year two years three years five six seven years down the road and it's you know i think this is the last time you're ever going to see prices like this well, Steve, not to stack the deck on you, but we, we do have a note where we're going to hit in just a little bit here about some of the industrial demand, which I'm not sure if you've seen this one, may, may be a shocking or come as some good news by the time we get there. Although something you mentioned there with the rate cuts that, yes, I think there's times where that's been driving it. Interesting, after some of the commentary last week, now we have Neil Kashkari and others coming out saying that there might not be any rate cuts this year as they're concerned that inflation hasn't gone down as much as they would have liked, which on one hand seems direct contrast to their own summary of economic projections that came out a couple of weeks earlier. Yet here we are back in September of 2022, August, September timeframe, when we got to the $18 mark. We were still doing 75 basis point rate hikes back then. Yep. And certainly I get it for people who have been invested in silver for a long time. There's that tendency to say, well, we keep hearing about the deficit, but how come it doesn't impact the price? Not only have we gone from 18 to almost 28, as of Sunday night, we had 28, but we've had that happen while there have been rate cuts, been a lot of anticipate or been rate hikes, rather, a lot of anticipation of cuts yet. I mean, 18 to 28, while your hiking rates is perhaps even more significant than if you just had a flat rate environment and just just rather stunning. And one other thing that I think would be worthwhile to get your opinion on, touched on this a little bit, but here on the Kitco chart, this was the Friday price. And here is where the labor report comes out where there were 303,000 jobs added, which was significantly above the expectations. And this being one of the reasons why I start to wonder if there might be something else going on here, because normally we would see gold and silver get pummeled on days like that. And you see there was a little drop, yet this was one of those moments where it's like, okay, maybe we're entering a different part of the cycle here, because to see Silver goes up almost a dollar from the low to the high. Gold had a similar substantial move. Any thoughts on what we saw there on Friday? Because I think that along with what happened on Sunday night when market opens, silver down about 50 cents, then shoots a dollar higher. These are certainly things that I don't remember seeing, perhaps not even in 2011. But what, what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, again, I one of the things that we've talked about for a long time is is you know the fact that silver people silver producers aren't making money at 26 20 even 27 dollars you know we need especially with the inflation we've seen over the last you know 10 years and what costs have gone up but i mean i can go back to where a company like first majestic needed 25 dollars silvers to break even 10 years ago and then that doesn't factor in any of the increasing costs that have come across the board in mining so now, I mean, that's one of those reasons why we've talked about $30 silver for a long time. So you've got this, you've got that side of things where you've got the silver companies have become gold companies because they don't make money in silver. But then you get into the reports of, okay, you know, and forever they could get away with that because the above ground supply of silver was, you know, we've got 165 years of run of silver above ground so it doesn't really matter if what the producers are you know have because sitting above ground in vaults and everything else we've got all this silver well now you're starting to see reports um and one of them you mentioned earlier but you know we've got one to two year supply you know from a major bank now saying this is what we have above ground and and largely due to what we've been talking about and that's this new industrial demand and how that affects silver and how over 50 percent of Silver now is consumed in the industrial side of things, especially in solar, car batteries, even talking more so people have dove into like how these 5G networks and all the, youth, the demand for silver to build out these networks in countries and how that's affecting things. 
And so this particular article talked about how we've got one to two years left of above ground silver. And if we ever have another like silver squeeze weekend and really start pinching the physical supply on, on the monetary side, then it's going to be even less than a year and it's just disappearing. And so where is all that silver above ground silver going? And we've, you know, Chris and I talked offline here, but you know, there's a lot of speculation that it's those industrial users are taking delivery on their long contracts and that, that, that silver as a way of making sure that they're getting their silver. But if we're out of that in 12 to 24 months, how are those industrial users going to get their silver then? And that's where, again, they're going to have to go or they, you know, and what I'm shocked they haven't done yet is go directly to those mining companies and try and secure the supply and do it at a premium to spot with the mining company to say, we're going to pay X above spot. You're going to put your, and we'll give you a bunch of money here to finance you or, or support you to guarantee that contract and then move forward with spot and pay the premium from there because they're going to be competing with all their competitors trying to make sure that they have their line and supply and silver. And if the above ground silver is gone, then that's the only way they're going to be able to get it moving forward. And we all know we've been operating at a deficit that's been ignored, you know, for years now on the amount that's produced versus what's consumed. So it's, it's that massive, you know, storm that's been brewing and it's finally starting to come to a head and really should come to a head if you believe the TD article there, you know, in the next year, probably in the next year, you're going to see prices absolutely skyrocket to start meeting the demand or, and you can't bring on new mines that quick. So yep. we're in a window here of about 10 years before you'll really start to affect, you know, new supply coming out of the ground. There's, there's projects out there that are undeveloped, but a lot of them have political challenges that won't let them go into production now, or they need, you know, based on costs and just in general, what the cost of mining silver is, you're going to need substantially higher prices to justify building a mine. Yes, and fortunately, Steve, along the lines of what you just mentioned there, did have an interesting comment I found listening to an interview with Peter Kraut and David Morgan. And here, Peter describes some of the conditions regarding what you were just addressing of users going direct to some of the companies. And I'll play a little bit here because I think, I think this will be interesting for people to hear. So let's take a listen. Um you know, I was at uh, PDAC uh, just a few days ago at Hills Investor Forum, and there um, I, I spoke to a uh, someone who runs a large silver producer, uh, not in North America, and they sell uh, their their uh, product out to China and to um, to the West. And he told me he said our um, our sales to China or our sales period are so tight. The buyers are coming to us and are saying, uh, can we have it? Can we have the product? They're they're willing to pay a couple of weeks in advance of delivery. And they're and they are willing to in China, they're willing to pay three dollars over spot to get the silver. So the markets are very tight. And <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter, I think, maybe what we see on the surface. This is someone who deals with it day to day and uh and knows and knows exactly, you know, where it's going and um just how badly uh, the consumers want it. So that was the first thing that I wanted to say. We, if we, so I thought that was rather telling to hear that that is what some of the conditions are like, especially on the Chinese side, where as of Monday, seeing a thirty dollar and sixty four cent silver price in the Shanghai Futures Exchange. And any thoughts on what Peter shared there, Steve? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the start of what I was just talking about. I mean, you've got okay, so they're paying three dollars. If they're paying three dollars over twenty seven, I mean, you're you're not at the premiums that we certainly know people pay here for bullion, and when we're trying to get our supply, and when it got really tight, people are paying you know hundred percent premiums. So that number, even if it, if that's the start of it, that's going to amplify. There, those guys that are coming and saying we're going to pay three dollars, are going to have to pay a lot more as the supply tightens and tightens and tightens more. And there's more and more pressure on them to try and find that supply and lock it in. So, you know, is that mining company signing a deal? How long is of a deal do they have with those Chinese buyers in that case? But yeah, around the world, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing all these metals, both gold and silver, move east. They're they're leaving the Western world and they're going east. And we're, you know, losing more and more of the control that, or that we're not, the U.S. is losing, you know, and the government and the banks are losing more and more control that they've always had over those prices. 
and that's going to get amplified you know as the BRICS nations finally you know when they decide to come out with what they're going to come out with that they've talked about for years now that's been largely ignored here in the west of the pressure and the how the conflict that should exist there them challenging the u.s currency as the world trade currency um these are all things that are going to amplify and change those prices and and start to move them up but it's you know it's as much as we want to cheer for that we also don't want the, the west to crumble because that's going to affect people's livelihoods and everything else but but as far as gold and silver and prices going up i mean this is what's going on and and the general public for the most part has no idea you know the the people that have followed and dug into these things you know are starting to get it and have always set their arms up of you know why why aren't these prices moving up and why is, aren't these things happening but the media for the most part has never covered it they don't talk about gold and silver they don't talk about the pressure that's there they don't talk about the demands you know they want to talk about green energy but they don't talk want to talk about the amount of mining that's needed to produce that green that you know green energy and the fossil fuels that go into the mining of you know the materials for the green you know energy products so there's, you know, people live in this kind of, you know, rose, rose colored glasses world and, and see what they want to see on one side, but they don't realize all the other stuff, you know, it's the green is good, mining is bad, well, you need mining to do the green thing. So, it's, you know, people invest in their iPhone, but they're not investing in the companies that produce all the materials it takes to make their iPhone or their car or their solar panels or their windmills or everything else that goes on in the world. So it's, at some point, people are, there's going to be more and more media attention towards this, people are going to wake up to it, but it's kind of becoming too late because the the east has been aware of it is trying to position themselves certainly you know china and what they've gone around and controlling large parts of the world where they're opening their own mines and shipping all of that product only back to china especially in africa and other parts where they can bring in their own labor forces to work you know their existing mines and and the west is lagged behind and we've you know things are going to have to change or or you know our livelihoods are going to get dramatically affected but but the gold and silver will look really good so let's hope that there's a balance there in between but in the end it all you know for those that have stacked silver and gold and, and bought shares of these mining companies you know you're gonna do really really well and continue i mean we're right at the start right now of a run up and these runs last for multiple years and and for silver specifically like i say that industrial this is the first time in its history, it's had this level of industrial demand affecting its price. It's always just been the poor man's gold and outperform gold on the way up, which it still will do. And I think it'll do it, you know, amplified because of the industrial side on top of it. Yes, I certainly agree. And a few things you mentioned in there, obviously, whether there's much coverage of gold and silver, that has been changing a bit. The past couple of weeks, there's been CNBC, uh, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal have all gotten into it. This was interesting, came out on Monday. Here is City, who has, this is the third time they've either pushed forward how soon they expect the prices to get there or raise the target. And now they have our zero to three month price target for gold and silver increased to nine and 16%, 2,400 gold, 28 ounce per ounce silver. And further lift the six to 12 month top side levels to $3,000 gold and $32 an ounce silver. That would be something if we saw $3,000 per ounce for gold within the next year. And certainly from 2350, that doesn't seem as far fetched as perhaps when we were dipping below 2000 a little while ago. I would caution, I imagine there will be some pullbacks along the way. I've, I don't know what to expect. I'd be a little bit surprised if we continue to see gold. If it traded for the next two months like it has for the past two months, that would certainly be quite an environment. Although, hey, Steve, we're we're also living in a world now where the Philadelphia Reserve Bank is writing papers about whether the gold standard would lead to price stabilization. And amazingly, here's the Federal Reserve coming to the conclusion that while the gold standard exposes the home country to short-term fluctuations in money, prices, and output, it ensures long-term price stability as the quantity of money and prices only temporarily deviate from their standard state levels. So, <laughs> I mean, maybe there is a bit of a shift. Here was the Wall Street Journal wondering if the Federal Reserve was wrong with their hiking and cutting plans. And 
hey, maybe they read the paper about how the gold standard would have been better. And one other one here was from the World Bank Gold Investing Handbook for Asset Managers. So a lot of coverage coming out, although I did promise you, Steve, that I did have a surprise for you today and for everyone watching at home. I don't know if we have talked about this before on the show. This was a study done by Oxford Economics Fabrication demand drivers for silver in industrial jewelry and silverware. And if we take a quick look here, the main points. So this is over the next 10 years. And again, I, I get it. 10 years, we're talking about the future. A lot can happen. Maybe green plans change. But just based on where we're at today, over the next 10 years, I, I don't think, I don't know that Oxford Economics has a, an agenda here. So... And I've read through the report. It's quite interesting. I'll put that in the description field below. Just what they came back with, we forecast global we forecast global output of end users of industrial silver will increase 46% in real terms. Rapid growth, electro, electrical and electronics applications, 55%. Jewelry fabricators output, 34%. Silverware, 30%. Combined of industrial jewelry and silverware coming in at 42%. So at least based on this, you, you mentioned we're at a point where you haven't seen before of the industrial demand. So it's it's already hard to see how the gap would be filled at the current levels, let alone if we get anything close to what they're forecasting here. Oh, I know. And then on top of that, you talk about, you know, well, they always, the Silver Institute will point, point to recycling. Well, I, I, you know, oh, we've always kind of questioned the recycling numbers of what's getting turned back in. And I, I saw one report from someone that I trust that talked about $75 as the cost to recycle. Even if, you, if they drop all the electronics in your lab and say, here, this contains silver, if you want to recover that, it's going to cost you $75 an ounce to recover it in that, you know, with circuit boards and everything else that have these silver components to them. So again, even if you're going to start trying to recover, you know, the silver that sits above ground that's been used over, you know, the last, you know, decades to hundred years, however long, far back we want to go. It's at $75 to start breaking even on recovering that. Like this is just another level of you know people say where the silver is going to come from and some I've you know often say, oh well it's in all this stuff we'll just you know they'll reprocess it and and so unless obviously technology can change and maybe that cost can come down by some new method but currently it's supposed to be about seventy five dollars an ounce to recover that so nowhere near even if you know you people are obviously going to go and do other methods before they ever start trying to recover what's already been used in in all of these various components so like you say we're already at a deficit we know you know based on existing projects it's going to take six plus years if a project is you know sitting there right now to get permitted and get built and get, get to production in a lot of these countries or longer depending on the ones that need political changes and everything else and even then the amount of projects that are out there don't meet the demand that exists for the metal so Let's amplify that and add, you know, if they're right, 42% above the current demand over the next 10 years, and it just compounds the problem even further. And there's no alternative. There's no, there's certainly no alternate at that price point to be that conductive metal component in on the industrial side when we're talking about, you know, the green movement. And but even if you don't have a green movement, be like people love solar. They love the idea of all these other things that aren't necessarily part of the green movement. They're just you know, different ways of getting your power and not relying on, you know, your power authority. If you can produce it yourself, people like the idea of that. So I don't know. It's 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 a great place to be. And if they're gonna finally allow it to run and get to where, you know, these mining companies can actually, you know, make a few bucks off this on the silver side, then then let's go. <laughs> yeah, and and I guess that's why we see things like T D Securities putting out a report warning of a silver squeeze and it's interesting because as you were saying that i'm wondering well are we seeing part of that reflected in the silver price in the recent move perhaps yes although i would think that would be more the case if we had seen silver go up six bucks while gold stayed flat this seems you know that it would be 
in line with the factors that are driving gold as well. And perhaps we have not seen any premium reflected yet for what's going on in terms of the supply. Although, of course, we will keep an eye on that going forward. And Steve, the last thing I wanted to touch on with you was obviously you're running Silver Viper Minerals, where you have been down in Mexico, in Sonora, exploring. Um, and I know you had news out last week on Thursday that you are doing a financing. So perhaps you could catch us up to speed on how things are coming together there and where the project is at and how the financing is looking. Yeah, I mean, it's this from, you know, not just my history in the in the sector, but talking with a lot of, you know, the guys that have been in the sector you know, for decades longer than myself. And and they've talked about this last two, three years has been the worst market they've in in any anyone's recollection of what it was like for juniors and and in the silver space and gold space, trying to capitalize and rate, you know, just in this environment where rates were going up and there was zero interest in the sector where the funds that traditionally do all the funding of the companies had, you know, just net outflows for years and years and years and so to finally you know have some joy and see some interest you know in our case we saw you know especially last week but even over the last few weeks we've seen our volumes and our trading on our stock with no marketing with no you know additional you know efforts of at all you know and we're seeing our volume skyrocket and that's that's been the first time in a lot in a long time we've seen you know just people that have been following and learning about these silver companies finally really start to deploy their capital and you know start buying in the market and then you know the share price moved up and we're one of many silver companies or or junior mining companies out there that obviously you know have been waiting and waiting and waiting patiently trying to get by trying to do what we can capital wise so to be able to get back in the market now We've got a you know placement, like you said, that we've announced to raise up to four million dollars. That's going to free us up to get back to work and drill all these targets and expand on our existing resource that's very attractive already at at La Virginia. And you know, and what we saw with you in the first twenty four hours of that placement, you know, we saw a lot of capital come in, and this is capital from funds. We've had at least eight funds participate so far that have made commitments on the placement. Um, there's still some room, but it's filling up very quickly. It's it's you know finally showing like there's a there's a change in the wind and we're getting you know a tailwind to start helping the mining companies, so you know we're we're excited that we're probably one of the earlier ones to get into the market and get capitalized and that's going to allow us to get to work sooner than our peer companies start producing the results that we know we can produce at El Ruby hopefully make some new discoveries on El Molino you know on the back end of displacement we'll start at least a five thousand meter program, um, drilling those two targets so. You know, it's it's feel it's a really good place to be. It's exciting, and and we're excited to get back to work. You know, we've been working, but to get back to drilling, and really starting to add the value and increase our resource. You know, we'll still target having a a new resource out probably by the end of the year, on the project, updating that. Hopefully, that takes us. You know, well, we'll see what the drill results do. But you know, our next goal would be to be above that million ounce gold equivalent. We're sitting at about 700,000 right now. And I think, you know, on good results, we could expand it, you know, a lot further than that. So very exciting. I think it's a good sign for the whole industry that some of these funds finally have some inflows and some capital that they can redeploy into the space and, and exciting to be at the front end of that and, and ready to get to work sooner than a lot of other companies. Yeah. And in there, you mentioned the resource update, which that's good to hear that in an ideal timeline could be at the end of the year. And one thing I've heard you mention before is that you already have some ounces that are not in the current estimate that would be added from work that you've already done. And I'm assuming if we have the gold and silver prices stay anywhere near the current levels, that could potentially add even before the drilling is done from where you're already at and the resource you already have could both had an increase there. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, there's two different things that have already happened from our last resource that will add ounces, you know, economic ounces to a resource. You know, when we hire an independent, they have to say, okay, this is this is the resource based on certain metals prices. And obviously we've seen a dramatic increase in both gold and silver from the time our last resource was done. So that will then, you know, it might lower the grade, but they're going to say this today is economic and be willing to include that in the resource, which will add ounces. We've expanded our El Ruby 
area of the project at least 300 meters to the south from where the existing where the resource was and cut off on the last uh on our maiden resource on that part of the area so again there's a lot of drilling in that 300 meters to the south coming off of the arroyo that would be included in the open pit portion of the resource at el ruby that will be included you know before that was just empty rock and it was all part of the pit but it was there was no mineral attributed to that portion of the of the resource so again all that's going to be you know adding and then you know we make a new discovery on an area like el molino hopefully you know we've had a lot of really good surface sampling and mapping and and done there on the the breccia the structures which is our high grade structure at el ruby as well and so you make it a re, you know and we start delineating a resource there hopefully on the back end of discovery and just stepping out 50 meters at a time same as the way we did at el ruby and and then you know you have the potential for another el ruby or bigger um so lots of potential and then you know there's a dozen other targets that we've identified that we're going to get drill ready for future drill programs that all have new discovery potential it's very little of our project has been drilled and explored you know we made a discovery right off the bat at el ruby when we took over the project and that's been our main focus but the one thing that pausing drilling and and being out there in this tough market is it's really allowed us to go out and spend a lot more time out in the field exploring you know sending the guys out on their walks mapping sampling finding new structures looking around this project you know the el molino shows the potential for another parallel system two kilometers to the east of el ruby and so you know it's it's really exciting to see how all these things Kind of come together and, and continue running for kilometers you know these structures it's just vectoring in on where you're going to get the best best widths and grades to potentially mine the mineral but i fully expect that our resource whether it's this one or future ones we're going to grow it dramatically on this project because there's just too many good targets and there's too much mineralizing activity happening that we don't make additional discoveries and el ruby itself is still open along strike and at death so there's a lot of different ways and things going on and it's just nice you know after having our first pause ever in drilling that we're going to be able to get back and start drilling again yeah and steve i guess the last one for you here are you able to offer any sort of even ballpark estimate of when you would begin drilling and also perhaps when you might expect to get some results back yeah so once the financing closes here in the next you know, we'll see when hopefully it closes very quickly because we're getting the book, like you said, is filling up very quick. But, you know, we'll we'll put out a tender to the drilling companies to come and bid on the project to, you know, to two or three of them to come and provide quotes. We've already got all of our environmental, you know, Seminat permits in Mexico in place to drill all over the project. But we're, like you said, we're going to be focused on Ruby and Amelino. So we certainly have all of our holes that we'd be drilled in that area permitted and they have five year terms on that on those uh, permits so we have no delay on that front so once the drilling companies we decide who it is we'll be able to mobilize and get going very quickly i would expect to have rigs on site you know within a month of the closing of the placement and right now i mean again with prices moving up there's going to be a lot of people that are racing to get going and drilling but because i think we'll be at the front end of a lot of them you know our initial results i would expect i mean I, we'll see what happens but maybe two to three turnaround two to three week turnaround time once um, the materials have been sent to the lab, so that would probably lag drilling, you know, you drill the hole, we're splitting it, logging and doing everything. And then we'll get trucked into Hermosillo to the lab. So, you know, from the start of a drill program, first results out, maybe even as early as a month after we announced the start of the drill program, possibly, maybe a little bit longer, but, you know, it could change with the lab times and if, if a bunch of people start racing and getting materials in all at the same time. But that's kind of what we've been seeing and hearing for the last little bit anyways in the market so if we're closed in a couple of weeks say you know maybe even end of may you can start to see results well i know that will be uh i know that'll be leaving you feeling happy obviously it's been a tough two years with the market and being able to move some things forward and obviously it's good to see that we've had the rally which allows you to do the financing and get back out there drilling and hopefully, uh, like you said earlier, have a updated resource by the end of the year. And I'll just mention, uh, if people can find out more information, link to this in the description field below, but is at silverviperminerals.com. And of course, up here in the upper right, you have the contact tab where they can contact you, Steve, or Alicia, who is in investor relations and find out more about the project and 
they have questions or would like to participate, that is how you can do that. So, Steve, uh, a lot of good things happening this month, and it's n nice to see that after a long wait. But uh, great to catch up with you again, as always, and see what's going on in Silver and also at Silver Viper. And uh, again, congratulations that the financing is going well so far. And we will look forward to hearing more about it and, and see what progresses in the next month. Sounds good, Chris. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs>